Senator Ron Wyden, um, and he is happily offered to answer some questions. Um, this will be a little bit awkward. I'm gonna, you're going to ask questions, then I'm going to repeat them. If you have an incredibly long question, don't. Uh, if you still have an incredibly long question, um, then we can bring you a mic. Um, but in general, I'll repeat your questions I, in that way. I heard you guys really wanted a long speech, like maybe an hour or so. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he has at least tentatively, assuming the schedule actually works, agreed to speak at PuppetConf also. <laughs> So I'm thrilled to have you here. Um, we had talked a little bit um, in our muraled gonzo about uh, you know IP and copyright and software patents and um, you know all the great work you're doing trying to do there. And the main request you had was seriously, what's an idea to solve this? How do we actually? How do we not just stop bad things like SOPA, but how do we actually move forward? How do we? How do we? How do we do good things? Um, so if you have not just questions but great ideas for how to solve this, if you've been stewing and wondering, how do I get my fantastic idea in front of? the federal government, here's your answer. Um, now, we asked the whole company for questions two days ago, and we got, a week ago, we got one question up front, so I have no idea if they're going to have. They're, but they're ready now, I can tell. Yeah, I, I hope so. I, th I thought, w without giving you all a filibuster or anything like that, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how I got into this and use that as kind of a jumping off place to kind of discuss sort of what some of the issues are coming up. When I came to the Senate back in 1996, we essentially had had two United States senators, Mark Hatfield and Bob Packwood. They'd been there since well before you guys were born. And the economy had changed so dramatically, we were clearly going to continue to put a lot of focus on natural resources, and that will always be the case. But we had to get into some new areas. And so I came and I found that very few people in the Senate had really tried to think through some of the opportunities in technology. And back then, there were essentially no ground rules, essentially none. And a lot of you know that um, there were some pretty public spectacles, United States senators calling the web a series of tubes and things. You remember, remember, remember that? Oh, so yeah. It's, it, it, <laughs> It's not as if the place was exactly cover, coloring, covering itself with glory. And one of the first things that came up was people said, we got to do something about all the smut that's online. We got to do something about all this garbage. It's horrible. We don't want our kids to um, see all this stuff. And I was a parent of, you know, youngsters, so I wasn't in favor of kids seeing garbage. But as I listened to all this, I kept hearing stuff which suggested to me that the net, which was already showing such incredible promise, was going to suddenly, in these early days, basically set up these, you know, huge walls of censorship. And I said, you know, maybe we might want to think about an alternative, supposing we try some approaches that sort of steer clear of censorship, and we could empower parents to make their own choices. We could have filters and lots of voluntary stuff, but not get the government in the business of sort of repudiating the First Amendment and doing what I thought would be a lot of damage um, online. But very few senators saw it that way. And what happened was one of the first big bills, and I don't think I've ever seen anything like this, included two approaches to the censorship uh, question. One was the one that said, we're going to just have all those dirty little smutty things taken off online, and we're going to penalize any website that uh, runs something like that. And of course, I and others point out, so how would you even do something like that? Would like people stay up all night and read every website in America? And if you saw something, you try to blame. Uh, I think it makes sense to pay people to look yeah, at Yeah, it was internet, brilliant, right? right? It was brilliant. <laughs> and the other was our alternative approach. It was called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. It said, we're not going to censor uh, these kinds of communi communications. You're not going to have secondary liability on website for, for posters. It went to the Supreme Court. They struck down the censorship approach, and ours prevailed. And that has generally been cited as one of the reasons that money was available for social media, because nobody would have invested in the social media if they'd known that they were going to be liable for anything that uh, was posted. So I kind of use that as sort of the jumping off point for saying, at a minimum, let's do no harm here. At a minimum, let's recognize the value of expanded access to information, what has clearly now become open source 
materials, and we just sort of built on that with the Internet Tax Freedom Law, the digital uh, goods uh, legislation, the digital signatures uh, legislation. Then, of course, PIPA and SOPA came along, and that was really kind of our big transformational moment. We learned, and I had put a hold on this bill for years, we learned you could block something. Now the question is, can we figure out how to pass things? And that's where the conversation you know, started. And I said, pretend you're in my shoes. I know, for example, that this whole question of software patents has clearly been abused, and patent trolls and courts that you know, basically throw everything out, and I think I know what's wrong. I'm less certain about what's right. And so I said, well, maybe you guys can come up with some good ideas in that area. Now, you don't have to think them all up this afternoon when uh, you thought that you were going to get a slight... I'll, I'll give you a cell phone number later. Yeah, that's right. You're going to get a little bit of a, of a diversion. But let's use that as kind of an opening salvo. And what I really like is pretend you're in my shoes. The role's reversed. You're trying to walk through some of these issues in front of the Senate, and particularly in the context of an empowered, an empowered opportunity because we've shown we can block something. Now let's see if we can turn that into something where we can actually come up with sensible ideas as an alternative. You guys don't have to write bills. In other words, you don't have to go back and say, my God, this guy asked me to write a piece of legislation. The question is, can we come up with some understandable, straightforward alternatives in areas particularly that build on PIPA and SOPA and open access to in, in information and a better balance between proprietary rights and uh, expanded opportunities for public access. All right. That was a great setup. So questions? So, so the one end of the spectrum is that uh, patents on software ought to be illegal and shouldn't be issued at all, and uh, ones that have already been issued should be retroactively revoked. What are the arguments against that? Well, I, I always start this with a sense that it's important to recognize a little bit of the conflict between head and heart. This is the mascot who already registering strong approval of the Senate. <laughs> Pro-sequestration dog. So I'm the son of an author. My dad wrote historical nonfiction, really important nonfiction works that I'm very proud of. He fled Nazi Germany in the 30s. Not all our family got out. He taught himself English himself and became an award-winning journalist. He wrote a book about the Bay of Pigs, and there's a picture of him on the back with Fidel Castro, and Castro says, Peter Wyden knows more about the Bay of Pigs than I do. That makes me very proud. He did a lot of original work. So my heart is with you. My heart says information ought to be free for all the reasons that you see every day around here. My head tells me, you know, when you're doing something where you're really adding value, and I mean, we were talking about the Cotton Gin or Edison or what have you, those were big deals. So there is a case for proprietary recognition. As long as you give something, you should get something back. I think where this has gone awry is the sense that you get something without giving very much. And so if we can work through a better balance, I think that's the opportunity. Yeah, my, the, on the whole patents, like they were originally built to, you, you get 17 years of monopoly in exchange for telling the world about your idea. And to these days, it doesn't happen as much. Um, and one of the challenges of that, of course, is you couldn't pass that today, right? I don't think you couldn't get that past the Senate, is my expectation, right? Well, the, the big question, of course, in the Congress is just making sure that people are comfortable with even weighing you know, the balance, because these are not issues that are talked about a whole lot in the Congress. I know that when we started out um, in the House and we talked about the Communications Decency Act, a couple of the tech uh, publications said I was one of the most internet savvy members of Congress. 
And man, I was really puffed up about myself. I thought this was just great, and I was going to put it on all kinds of advertisements and send it, you know, hither and yon. And I told my children about this, and they just started laughing. <laughs> they said, you're one of the most tech-savvy members of Congress. You send me an email, you text me, you watch the Blazers online. You know, what's everybody else like? <laughs> so I think we want to understand these are not issues that get debated every single day you know, in, in, in the Congress. And I think that's, that is one of our opportunities as well. We showed, again, in Pippa and Sopa how to block something. And I have now members of Congress coming up and saying, well, how do we deliver the PIPA constituency. And I've tried to say, you know, this is a little different here. This is not like there's some huge block. I mean, there are a lot of people who spend more time online in a week than they spend thinking about who they're going to vote for, for in the United States Senate in a year. So this doesn't work that way. But I do think understandable ideas, particularly post-PIPA, where we've got some attention, have a real opportunity. And that's essentially how I walk in and say, um, the kidding part, part aside, when you have good ideas, we're interested in them. Um, this is kind of a follow-on to Eric's question, but I guess to make the question more nuanced, what is your feeling on obvious use patent type stuff, like uh, pay to click or the lawsuit between Apple and, and uh, Samson around usability gestures that are obviously so intuitive to a user, they're like pressing a gas pedal on a car. Um. I think you answered it. I mean, this is obviously not what was intended in terms of this concept. You really ought to have to give something to get something. The question is, what do we do in terms of laying out, you know, an alternative? And in a lot of these areas, I mean, sort of in technology, what I've tried to do is to recognize I know what I don't know. And in this space, I have a pretty good sense that the system is out of whack, that a lot of smart people that I like and that I'm comfortable with philosophically are asking questions like, what's the point of having copyright at all? And their whole websites, I don't know if any of you read Tech Dirt, that's one of my favorites with Mike Masnick, he makes that point very well and very art articulately. I think we need to come in and do more than say, look, all this stuff is screwed up. There shouldn't be you know, any copyright at all. And try to kind of walk people through how there might be a fairer uh, approach that would be better for innovation. Here's what's really going on. And, and on this point, I'm going to stand because it's something I feel so strongly about. What you guys are doing is really disrupting business as usual. <laughs> and even the PIPA and SOPA discussion, what was really Everything go. Okay. What was really appealing about the PIPA and SOPA win is it basically beat all the intermediaries in Washington, D.C. In other words, all the people associated with the Motion Picture Association and the recording industry and the Chamber of Commerce, when I started putting a hold on these bills, which was really two years before we had a wiki go dark and all that kind of, kind of thing, they all said, oh, you know, Ron's from Oregon and he's into all these kind of tech things. Let him talk for a little while and then we're going to go out and get 85 votes. And I said, guys, you may have all of these kind of Washington insiders, the advertising firms and the lawyers and the political action committees and the like, but I think you're going to see there is an empowered online constituency here, constituency here that think this is nuts. They're against piracy. We're not for people ripping other people off and selling fake Viagra and all the rest. But we're not for screwing up the architecture of this force for open access to in information, which is what it was all about. They were going to screw up the DNS system, the whole thing. They are going to really harm the architecture of the net. So what happened was the online community beat the intermediaries. That was what's so exciting. That was what's so frightening to them. And we were talking earlier that you can see that in practically everything else. You can see it in music. I've got a major internet radio bill now where we're taking on uh, the big labels. Same kind of thing. You know, are the artists going to have a chance 
to get access to the real opportunity to communicate directly with people, which is music online? Or are the labels going to just keep slicing a fat hog? And they've used their lobbyists and their political action groups, I think, incredibly well in the past, but I think it's a new day. And we need now, in addition, as I say, to blocking stuff, to, for example, you, an you, you essentially answered your own question because I think you knew that I certainly think what's going on with Apple and these patent trolls and, and, and the like has you know, really defied common sense. I'm less clear about what we ought to offer as an alternative. Ooh, oh, is I, am I in the wrong place? Should well, I be sitting down again? You get about Bob Leon here, we might lose your head. Okay. It's the story of my life. Senator, Losing thanks for head. coming to see us. Yeah. Voting for you is my favorite vote uh, always. I've been in Oregon for uh, 40 years. I never miss a chance. You're kind. Thanks. Um, Thank, you. Thank you. So you've alluded previously to uh, ignorance amongst your colleagues, which is understandable because there's a lot to keep in mind. But how much of it... <clears throat> How much of the problem is ignorance in your colleagues uh, about the technical aspects of it versus access and having uh, people who really do understand it uh, being able to bridge the gap between where they live, like here or online, and representation uh, in your community? Well, I, I want to be just a little dip diplomatic and, and say what I've been trying to describe is the fact that a lot of what we're talking about certainly is not stuff that is talked about day in and day out in, in the Congress. And part of it is the nature also of what's happened, is members of Congress get up in the morning and they say to themselves, I got 15 things I got to do between now and 9 o'clock you know, tonight. And a lot of the traditional industries have what really is a social network where you come back home and you meet with these organizations and they have political advocates and you communicate with people who are doing their messaging and, and the like. And what we're doing is basically, in effect, disrupting the status you know, quo. And I think we showed a lot here a year ago. It took place just a year ago. And I mean, I've, I literally have senators come up and say, we're working on this bill, Ron. Can you deliver the anti-PIPA SOPA crowd to us? And I say, gee, you know, it kind of doesn't work that way. This is not the old kind of approach where you have, you know, a gazillion names on a Rolodex and somebody sits and calls them all somewhere and says, you know, will you, you know, vote for something? Will you sign a petition or something like that? It's a such a dramatically different experience for members you know, of Congress. What we need to do is recognize we've got a great opportunity on our hands, and that is if we lay out some sensible ideas, I think we'll have a chance to get them across. Now, I wouldn't have told you that before Pippa and Sopa, but I've had a number of senators come up and say, I understand what people were saying now. I really hadn't spent a lot time on these kinds of issues in the past. I know this is something that ought to get uh, more attention. So yes, there are certainly going to be individual legislators who are going to say, look, I've spent all this time defending a particular you know, practice. I sometimes call it the status quo caucus because that is part of kind of protecting the incumbents. The ideas and the views you all are trying to convey are simply too disruptive for that group. But you are on the right side of history. And having kind of stumbled into this back when I came to the Senate and recognizing the economy uh, is changing so dramatically, I want to be out, out there trying to shape federal policy in order to let folks like yourself um, have more say in our future. Your point about the economy is interesting because one of the things that I'm always you know, the status quo and, and the intermediaries always kind of come to a, a similar story, which is like very large companies have a certain set of rights that are hard for um, individuals or smaller companies like Puppet Labs. You know, we're competing with companies that make $5 billion a year or, you know, $50 billion a year. Um, and we don't have problems with our customers, but when, uh, you know, the customers like us, but when, when things get structurally complicated, when, you know, to do business, we have to spend a certain amount of money on lawyers every year, those things start to get complicated. And, and I'm curious how much 
of the, the conversation in Congress is about um, that kind of balance, which is related to the, uh, the IP concerns. It's related to software patents and things like that. But it's really about um, is the balance in power between the, the, the very large incumbents who are already billionaires, already making billions of dollars, and the smaller disruptive players. You said you know, the, the, the cause of history is on our side, which is absolutely true, but there are generally a lot of people strung up on trees in between here and success. So I don't know, what, what can, you know, how, is, how is the Congress thinking about that transition right now? Because it clearly is a transition. Um, is that kind of specific part being talked about right now? It isn't yet a debate day to day. But increasingly, it is coloring so many of the big discussions. I mentioned, you know, internet, you know, radio. Coming so soon after the debate about PIPA and SOPA, I think senators are starting to see that some of the artists who historically would be with the incumbents and say, you know, our bread is buttered by kind of getting these crumbs from the labels, we're not going to do anywhere near as well as we would signing up for a very different future of having their art, having their music somewhere else, which is online. And yes, you've got a whole bunch of the lobbyists for the recording industry already spreading disinformation and misinformation about me and the bipartisan bill that I've got. So it's not as if senators show up every day and say, let's talk about the incumbents versus some of the dis, you know, disruptors. What they usually have to do if they come from an ag area, they have to talk about the farm bill. If they come from the Midwest, they're concerned about EPA and some rule affecting coal or something like that. But more and more when they see me and we circulate some of these bills and ideas, we're getting follow-up calls. We didn't get that before PIPA you know, and SOPA. I mean, that was, to give you an idea of what it was like and why it was so incredibly satisfying, you know, I have all these young people, you know, in our office. We've been working for two years, week after week after week, to try to organize opposition to PIPA and, uh, and SOPA. The big day was just about a year ago. It was Tuesday, January 24th. And the leadership of the Senate had scheduled a vote on whether or not to override my hold on the bill in effect, to block PIPA and SOPA. And everybody said, you know, there's no way our side, you know, can win. And the Wednesday before the vote, it must have been around the 18th or something like that, that was the day that our whole campaign really kicked in. All these sites went uh, out and said, here's why this is a bad idea. A couple of sites, as you know, went completely black. And in effect, on Capitol Hill, on Wednesday before the vote, the Wednesday before the vote to override my hold, 15 million people either emailed or called or in some way registered their opposition to the bills and said, stand with our side to hold them up. And 24 hours later, Friday, there was the announcement that the bill had been pulled. And I called one of my staff you know, up, one of our communications people, a woman who's really talented, now in Hollywood, done a wonderful job, I talked to all the time about these issues. And I called her up, it was a little bit afterwards, and I think you know, the traditional conversation is if you won something, you know, what should you say or should there be a press release? And I just called her up and I said, so are we a little bit less cynical about government this morning? And she just started howling and cheering, and everybody in the background was howling and cheering. That's what it meant. And now the question is, how do we translate this, particularly since, apropos of your question, I think when we, in effect, tag one of these issues, make it clear that there's something you know, coming up that's important, I think we'll now be able to engage people rather than just be automatically dismissed because the money and the power has been on the other side. The ultimate complement to the disruptors is now a lot of the incumbents are trying to copy you. A lot of the incumbents are going out and starting these big efforts to communicate online and use social media and the like. Ultimate complement when somebody says, hey, you're the people who figured it out. We better do it or we're going to be out of business. We have one more quick question.
So um, since we're talking about the uh, anti-PIPA, anti-SOPA campaign, um, I think for a lot of people who were participating in that, whether by making phone calls or whatever, the, the, the impact was a little opaque. Like it wasn't clear what, what was most effective, what got the most attention, and what are the best things to focus more on in the future. And I was wondering if you could give us a bit of an overview from your side about what kind of citizen action got the most attention, what kind of citizen action got the most done. It was the cumulative effect, and as you know, there were online you know, petition drives, and every week for months we were cooking up something. At one point, we were working with a network of groups saying we were going to read names of people from around the country on the floor of, um, of the Senate. And I think if I had to describe the campaign, we snuck up the other side. In other words, I put a hold on the predecessor to Pippa and Sopa in the fall of 2010. And they probably could have passed it in the fall of 2010. The whole Pippa Sopa ensemble had anybody really thought about what was ahead because other than me, that was pretty much you know, about it. But we managed to run out the clock in 2010. You know, it started again in 2012, and almost overnight, almost overnight, the pro-PIPA side got 40 United States senators signed up. That is an army. I mean, in a Senate where it's hard to get people to agree to order a Coca-Cola, almost 50% of the Senate was out there saying, let's you know, pass PIPA. And so what we started to do is chip away at some of the obvious kind of flaws in the bill. I mean, the idea that you would dismantle almost the domain name system, you know, fundamental architectural features of the net gave us a natural kind of entree into showing that their side was unreasonable. And, and frankly, a lot of people who asked, so tell me a little more about the domain name system. This is kind of like the phone book. It's a sort of the basic way in which you get into, uh, into the net. And we kept saying, we're against piracy. I must have said, if I had a nickel for every time I said I'm against piracy, you know, I'd we be... We need to fundraise for next, yeah, next that'd, election. Yeah, be, be done. So we said we're against piracy, but I said, do you really want to dismantle this huge force for open and expanded communication just because you aren't willing to kind of think this through? And we actually... We sort of open sourced the bill. We came up with an alternative called the Open Act. Maybe you saw it online where we were talking about saying that instead of dismantling the architecture of the internet, you could treat this as an unfair trade practice because a lot of the most serious offenders are these big operators, really only eight, 10 of them overseas, and bring them in and take it through a trade proceeding rather than damage the net. So it was a pretty big educational you know, undertaking, and to this day, people say, so what are you guys going to do to offer an alternative? And that's why I sort of walked in and wanted especially to come today, because I think a lot of people are asking your question. What are the lessons here? It's kind of opaque. I saw that Wiki went black, and a bunch of people in the Senate, like Ron Wyden, thought that was a good thing. And then everybody says, well, what else does it really mean? And I think the real lesson is a very empowered new constituency has developed. I think this is a chance to really take the intermediaries and say you are going to play a very different role, if any, in the American economy because we're going to look to more opportunities for people who are innovators, who are disruptors to communicate directly with people and not just have political action committees and public relations people and supporters of the status quo in Washington carry uh, the future. I think the future deserves better. All right, well, I guess that's it. Let's um, do it again soon. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.